I'm Chris Lindgren with Humenta. Thank you for joining us today. Please be sure to use the Q&A function at the bottom center of the screen with your questions. The chat is also available to you and I'll be monitoring that, but we ask that you please use the Q&A function for questions and we will be getting to those later in the webinar. I will now turn it over to our CEO, Vesna Prakovska, who will introduce our CTO and special guest lecturer. Hi everybody. Oh, you, yeah, thank you, Chris, for the for the introduction. Welcome everybody. I hope you're having a great uh, Wednesday. Um, today I'm joined by my other co-founder uh, and CTO of Humanta, Paolo Rodriguez, and a very special guest, Emeritus Professor Barter Har Romani from Eindhoven University of Technology. Professor Romani is a renowned expert in the field of biomedical imaging and AI, and he was a, the PhD advisor for both mine and Paolo's thesis. He is a lifelong mentor and a very dear friend. Uh, he's worked his whole career in biologically inspired medical image analysis algorithms, especially for computer-aided diagnosis for different applications in cancer, diabetes, for the heart and brain image-guided neurosurgery and visualization of brain connectivity using diffusion MRI data. He is the president of Dutch Society for Pattern Recognition and Image Processing and has been the president of Dutch Society for Biophysics and Medica Biomedical Engineering and also the Dutch Society of Clinical Physics. Bart's new book, um, Neuromathematics of Deep Learning and Visual Perception, will be published in about six months time. And today we are in for a real treat. It's a very special and exciting lecture, uh, sort of a sneak peek of, of the exciting work that um, Bart is uh, working on. Uh, I hope we'll have some time for, for Q&A and discussions on this fascinating topic uh, on what can AI learn from our own brains, bridging the gap between biology and code. So let me not uh, prolong anymore. Uh, Bart, um, please, uh, the floor is, uh, I, I wanna give the floor to you and I'm very excited to, to learn more about this topic. Thanks for this kind introduction. And thanks for the invitation to speak at this Qmenta webinar. I'm proud of Qmenta and on the good work that you do. Today, I will speak about what can AI learn from our own brains. And I also mean what the other way around, what can visual neuroscience learn from AI? And for that, let's have a look at the modern deep neural networks. If we look at deep neural networks and why are they called deep? Because they have so many layers. We see to the left, the input layer, and then the second and the third and the and so on. This is AlexNet, one of the first uh, famous convolutional neural networks. Convolution means that the small filters you see as small squares here, they filter, they do a convolution. At the end, they give 1,000 outputs. That means this network can recognize 1,000 classes. And it's deep because all these layers are a deep network. And there is a forward pass, that means you feed the network with images. At the end, you see the class coming out and you train it by the back propagation pass, which you say, okay, adjust all the weights that are in this network, the, the connections between the neurons, I will explain it a little bit later, in such a way that it gives the right answer, that the error is negative. And these many layers, we also see in the neural network in our visual system, which you see below. We have the retina to the lower right, with a couple of cells, actually many cells, which will be explained later. Then it goes to the LGN in the center of our head. And here it goes to V1, V2, and all the layers that we see in the visual system. And the same structure with all these deep layers, we recognize in our neurophysiological system. It's big. It's about one quarter of our brain. So this whole back of our head is filled with our visual system. So really, we are visual machines. And networks are abundant. There are so many different networks. This is a, a, an image from a website, the neural network zoo. And you see there are many topologies, many configurations to make a network. 
and the visual system is the most studied network we have in brain research. So every little detail, there is a laboratory working on it. So this is already from 1991, and you see how complex it is. There's a lot of feedback, and I indicated that here with arrows, you have feedback everywhere. And we're going to study a little bit in detail what are both of these networks, what can they learn from each other. What they do actually is simulating a real neuron, and the neuron has a body, soma, and on that soma you get synapses, the connections from other neurons. And in the model you see that they are called weights, so they have a certain strength between 0 and 1. They add up, that's the sigma sign, this is the process of convolution, adding up all these weights. There is a threshold function. Every neuron has a threshold function. And at the end, you get some output. And here we have in some detail how this goes. And you do this layer after layer. So we see that we have a convolution layer, then the threshold. We do some max pooling. That means you take the maximum value from a layer. And then again, the same. Convolution, ramp, max, convolution, ramp, max etc etc and more than of these networks modern networks can have tens 20 30 40 sometimes up to 150 of these layers and what do these layers do if you study what they do they suppose you have a network that learns faces and in this case it can recognize uh, four faces as you see at the end so in the beginning you put a face in here you train all these blue lines, these are all the networks, and networks can be very extensive. You can have 100 million of these connections, so training is a very complicated step. That takes the longest time. Once it's trained, the network is fast. But once it's trained, you can see what has been learned, and if you look at what are these cells actually doing, well, they form very simple filters, edges and lines. And the next layer, become more complex. So from, let's say, three edges, you can build a nose. So here we have combinations that forms parts. And here we have models. So noses and ears and eyes form faces. And faces form groups. And groups form whole scenes. So actually what the network is doing is a stepwise increment of context. And there are many types of deep neural network topologies. Many famous ones. PCG16 is a really famous one, and this is how you indicate how the network looks like. All these little layers, you indicate how big they are. You have uh, units, they have connections between the different layers, so you see that that looks like the shape of a U. Um, you have uh, residual neural networks, and residual means that uh, you have a network, and you also look at the original signal that you, you add up. And this turns out to be a fantastic trick. It was published in the paper by Carmen Ge, and this paper is now cited 84,000 times more. It's the most famous neural network now. It's called RNN. And you have inception network, etc., etc. And this talk will not be about the many applications. I will show a few. Uh, this is a wonderful brain segmentation tool, one of the many tools that you can find on the Qmenta website. You can also look at uh, Google Lens. It's incredibly powerful. Um, if you, for example, uh, <coughs> want to recognize with your smartphone anything, suppose you have some pictures from a holiday and you don't remember what kind of temple or building was it, take a picture with Google Lens and it will tell you where it was. Self-driving cars. They have complete real-time vision and recognition, so they see pedestrians, other cars, uh, traffic lights, etc. And of course you can do image generation. It's quite famous too, it's called uh, Generative Adversarial Networks, GANs. And you can make any new image from an old one, etc, etc. There are quite a few of these applications. Actually, every conference now is uh, talking about AI in its work. But it's still largely a black box. So let's talk a little bit about uh, what we uh, call the, yeah, 
the very structure of the brain. And here, what we hear now is a very old experiment by Hubel and Wiesel. And you hear the cells, this was from 1962, this was a stimulus that they gave to a cat and they recorded from a single cell in the visual cortex. What you hear is a very low frequency, 2 to 6 kilohertz of this firing. And that's pretty amazing. My laptop is 2 to 3 gigahertz. And the most amazing thing is that th my brain is only using 25 watts in power. And these modern data centers, they have uh, cooling towers on top. They use megawatts, even 10 to hundreds of, of megawatts. So the brain is incredibly energy efficient. And let's study a little bit the techniques that the brain is using to do that. So what I'm going to talk about is uh, explainable AI. What steps can we take? It's called XAI. Well, first of all, if we have a network like a deep neural network, we have quite nice access to these networks because we can look inside the computer and see what these cells actually do, these, these neurons. So if I have a network that is recognizing all kinds of objects, and suppose there is an Australian terror is one of the classes, you can train it and if you feed it to an image of an Australian terror, you can see what are these networks actually showing. And you can see that it's indeed in this picture, to the lower right we have the dog, you see that in this class activation map, if you relate it to the Australian terror class, it nicely shows up. People have looked in all kinds of networks and there's a nice website it's called OpenAI Microscope. Let's have a look at this website. And to the lower left, you see all kinds of networks that of the lower. So let's say we take uh, um, VCG19 and, or we take Inception V3, Inception V1. All these networks can be studied and what we see it's pretty much, it looks beautiful, but not really understandable. One of these first layers, if you look in detail, what are all these filters do? It looks beautiful and you see, well, there's all kinds of texture being recognized. And probably this is coming back, but very hard to understand what, what these cells actually really learn. It's nice to play with this and you see a lot of nice structures, but uh, everybody is struggling with uh, yeah, what is all this meaning? So before we look into the biological networks, let's study a little bit more um, the brain, the visual system. <coughs> and if you compare neuroscience and computer science, both are incredibly advanced. In computer science, we have, of course, fantastic advancement of mathematical tools. Uh, we have um, chips that are incredibly powerful. But if you look in neuroscience, they have exactly the same progress. It's incredibly sophisticated. If you look at the visual system, <coughs> and actually everything in nature is organized with incredible precision. An example here, this is an electron microscope image from uh, the cells in your lens. And the lens is flexible, it has to be transparent. And you see that there is incredible detailed stitching of the cells to each other, uh, how they connect to each other, and still being flexible. Here we see the inner hair cells that measure the sound vibrations. It's incredibly well organized. Sorry. And this is the, uh, the human rods and cones. In a rod and a cone, you have the light-sensitive molecules, but we need quite a few of them and they live in a membrane, so you need an incredible amount of membrane. So in, in this rod, you see there are about a thousand little yeah, coin shapes, so little disks. And in these disks, we have the rhodopsin molecules that measure the light. So it's the most sensitive receptor that we know, and it's, it's quite incredible to see all this. So let's study the detailed anatomy of the retina. We see a small section of the retina here. Actually, light is coming from below. So 
we have the rods and the cones here on the top, so the light has to pass through all these nerve layers. <coughs> and the retina is brain tissue. It is really, it has the same blood vessels, neurons as brain tissue. On the bottom we have the output, we have the ganglion cells, and every ganglion cell has a fiber, they go into the optic nerve and they run to the brain. We have about 1 million ganglion cells and 150 million receptor cells. So to the right we see these receptor cells. We have four types. One rod type, that's for very dim light, and RGB, red, green, blue types for color vision in the cones. We have horizontal cells. They collect from a number of rods and cones. That's called a kind of receptive field, so they collect from a certain area. No, sorry. Then we have bipolar cells. There are 10 types of bipolar cells. There are 10, 26 types of amacrine cells. And there are 20 types of ganglion cells. So there's an amazing variety of all types of cells. And these cells, they are characterized, for example, here's the example of the bipolar cell, uh, by morphology, that means their shape, by their functionality, when do they fire, are they uh, selective for static images or for motion of a specific color. There's an incredible knowledge of the biochemistry and the pharmacology of these uh, cells, <coughs> beautiful staining techniques to find specific uh, properties. We can even uh, uh, stain um, uh, calcium activity. There's a lot of genetics and the stratification. Stratification means where do the endings, and you see it on the top, this is the layer where they have these endings and you see some end in the top layer, some in the middle and some in the lower layer. This is called the stratification. This is from a famous paper from Richard Marshland, uh, The Structure of the Retina. It's the most oxygen-using tissue in the body. It even has three layers of blood vessels. So you see we have blood vessels on the top, in the middle and on the bottom. If we look at even more detail, we can look at uh, one cubic micron of retina and this is a uh, very nice new technique um, where you have, uh, yeah, you have a small block and you cut layer by layer and you take an electron microscope and then see <coughs> what's in there. And this, for example, is a study where people have measured the stellate amacrine cells. You have an amazing amount of these amacrine cells. They have a star shape. And you see them right here, they're starbursts, um, and they are sensitive for motion, so they're very active in our motion sensing. You have several hundred million of those, and they overlap fantastically. So in one place you have at least 70 to 100 of these amacrine cells uh, overlapping, looking at the same place on your retina. They have uh, a nice connection in the inner nuclear layer, and they're divided in two groups, the on and the off group. And we will later see what is the purpose on, of this. But the striking thing is that because we have so many ganglion cells, that means we also have so many mosaics. Every ganglion cell type has a complete mosaic in filling the whole space of the retina. So if we take the image as the input image here, the first mosaic, and this is just, let's say, a midget ganglion cell, is tiling the retina like this. Another one, type B, is like this. Another one, type C, is like here, and type D. And we have several dozens of those. And we don't know yet what is happening here, but there's one very specific message. We do not have, like a camera, one cone or one rod is being measured, and it's a high-resolution camera. It's a coarse resolution. You see that these res receptive fields are very large, but they overlap, and every receptive field is doing something different. For example, those number C 
they all measure velocities to the right. And this one B is velocity measuring in all kinds of other directions, but it's bidirectional. So we have to get a completely different idea from what the retina is. And these coarse and overlapping mosaics are in the visual system combined in the, to the sharp image that we perceive. And if you look at the image that I showed you before, you see that uh, we have these uh, cells. And here you already see, this was the retina, we have P cells and M cells. Well, the P cells are for parvo small, they measure shape, and the M cells these are all receptive fields measuring velocity. So you see already we have two main streams going to the brain and these streams keep being separated. So velocity and shape is completely being separated and probably much more is being separated. So we can actually conclude that the retina is not a camera. The camera brings images from A to B, but it's a perceptual grouping preparator. So let's have a look inside these detailed uh, neural networks. So Wolfram, the maker of Mathematica, has a wonderful website. It's called the Wolfram Neural Net Repository. We see it right here. And on this website, we see dozens and dozens of famous websites all available. And let's pick one. We look at the Inception V1 network. Well, this network you can download the full program. If you load the network by this command, netmodel, and you lane it, <coughs> you see that we get all these, all these layers. And there are quite a few layers are here uh, programmed in this, in this network. If you give it an image, and you can just drag an image into the code, for example, this image of a peacock, it tells you, yes, it's a peacock. But the most interesting, <coughs> interesting thing, what I want to show you now here, is visualize convolutional weights. And it's very easy with this program to say, OK, we have this command, and we have here convolution 1. It's the first layer, and we want to show the weights. And here we have the weights. And this looks quite interesting. This looks already a little bit like these edges and line filters that we saw uh, in the beginning. So what we measure in the visual system is here to the right. And you see that in the visual system, in V1, in the cortex, we find similar filters that have this uh, the shape like we see to the left, and we see to the right, to the left is from a visual neural network, and to the right is measured by sticking a needle in one of the cells in the cortex of a mouse, of, uh, sorry, of a cat, I show the cat a stimulus, and you see there are uh, there, there are black and white uh, points here. <coughs> and with a histogram-based technique, you can then measure and map all these receptive fields. So let's do a little bit of mathematics from these receptive fields, and let's start at the very basic. Let's start at the pixel. <coughs> if I look at pixels. And we see the pixels here, this is my own face, you see there's something terribly wrong with the pixels that we normally use. Uh, I don't have all these squares in my face, and I don't have all these edges. So square pixels, they're easy to make, but very wrong. They gave what you call spurious resolution, false edges and false corners. So we can do some nice mathematics. And this is, I'm not going to explain all these mathematics, but you have a function g, and g is my optimal shape for my pixel. So this should probably be not a square, but very likely a circle. That's much smoother. It should not be some blocky step function, which, which, uh, but it should be much smoother. Well, if you give it some nice constraint, and you say, OK, this filter should be 1, uh, the mean should be 0, and, and this should be the variance. With some nice mathematics, you can nicely show that the best shape of a pixel is the Gaussian kernel. This is just like a normal distribution. It's a very famous mathematical function. And you see it is indeed it is a circle. It is very smooth. And this is the best pixel shape. So if we have these 
pixels and in vision we see exactly this. Why do we need actually a thing like this? This is our aperture, our light measuring pixel. Let's do another step. Let's look at the environment of our pixel. So we look at the local environment, we call it the context. And in mathematics it's known if you want to describe a function a little bit to the left and a little bit to the right, you use what you call a Taylor expansion. And I have a small part of a movie here. If you have, for example, uh, a function, and this is the function right here in the middle, you call it f of zero because it's in zero, and you want to describe how is the function looking a little bit further away, you take the first derivative, you add the second derivative, you add the third derivative, you add the fourth derivative, and the more derivatives you add, the more you can nicely describe the surrounding around this point. Well, this is the very famous Taylor expansion. So what we need is the derivatives at this point. And this is exactly what we do here. The environment around my point, and let's say the point is A, is a sum of all these derivatives. And these derivatives, fn, they have to be measured in my pixel. But my pixel is the Gaussian, and I measure every pixel in the outside world, and they call it L infinity, that means infinitely sharp, measuring is a convolution. So here, this is my measurement, my observation, and now I want to take derivatives. Well, it turns out that you can put this derivative inside in front of the G, and now you say you can also measure, because convolution is measuring, with the derivatives of a Gaussian. And how do the derivatives of a Gaussian look like? Well, they are exactly like this here to the right. So to the top there is no derivative. This is the derivative in the x direction. And you see, this measures edges. This measures in the y direction. This is the second derivative, the third derivative. And these are exactly the filters that we see in the first layer of our artificial neural network and in our visual system. So it looks like the very first level in our visual system and in our network is by means of a Taylor expansion looking at the very local context of one pixel. And that's interesting. But can we also learn these filters? This is a model as we see. And for learning we have to see what is the best representation of a signal. And if you have a representation, that means, let's have a look at an image like this here. This is an image of a forest, and I take a very tiny image. It's called a patch, let's say 10 by 10 pixels. I have it right here. And now there's a mathematical technique that said, well, this tiny patch can actually be built by some basis patches. So alpha times the first basis, beta times the second, gamma times the third, etc. And from a few of these basis filters, and I don't need more than maybe 10 or 15, I can make every patch imaginable by just changing the weights, alpha, beta, gamma, etc. So it's very efficient to only store the basis. Then you don't need to store millions of these other ones, you only store those ones. Well, and that's exactly what uh, seems to happen. And the technique to find these bases is called principal component analysis, PCA. It's a nice technique where you measure uh, actually the variation in different directions. There is a cloud of uh, uh, points here. And you see there is one direction which there is, uh, this is the largest variation and this is the smallest variation. And those give you the eigenvectors from, from this data set. Not going to talk much about it, but this basis can actually be learned with the technique principal component analysis. So if we do that, we take lots and lots of these small patches and we put them in this technique principal component analysis. What do we get? We get exactly all these filters. And it's so nice that these filters are exactly the same as we see for the uh, Taylor expansion. So they form the basis from which 
this small basis of 25 uh, basis patches, I can make every patch in this forest. So this is actually learning from the forest, the first filters. And if you open your eyes, the first three months, this is exactly what you do. You see lots of scenes, and in your visual system, you make this. You make the, the filters to the right. If you limit your input, and here we get the uh, uh, filters. If you limit your input, and let's say you only look at vertical trees, well, there is only variation to the right, but not variation in the vertical direction. So now you see you only get filters that are measuring horizontal variation and not vertical. So you learn different filters if you have a different input. So the lesson is handcrafted filters are out. The filters are in the data. You need to learn from the data. And if you have different input, you learn different things. And this was done in a famous experiment by Blakemore uh, in the, actually it was in the 80s. He had a cat, and let's have a look what they did with the experiment in the cat. We regulate the visual environment by keeping kittens in complete darkness from birth, bringing them out for periods of controlled visual experience inside special cylindrical chambers. Here, a kitten is being exposed to an environment consisting entirely of horizontal stripes, and it wears a ruff to prevent it seeing its own body. This particular kitten will be exposed to these stripes each day from the age of three weeks until it is three months old. All the rest of the time, it remains in complete darkness. We regulate the visual environment so what do we see after these three months? The kitten can nicely see a horizontal stick. But if the stick is made vertical, the kitten no longer reacts to it. So this is quite intriguing. This kitten has not developed, and it is exactly like here, it has only developed for this specific type of stripes, and in his case it was horizontal stripes, so uh, it has developed a different visual system. And in the first three months of your, uh, after being born, uh, this is what happens. Later in life you can learn new things again, but it's, it, it's uh, yeah, a very nice insight in the, what's called the plasticity of neural networks uh, that you learn from the data that you get in. But now we have to go to the next step. So we have to bind, these edges have to be combined into noses, et, et cetera. So actually every point now here, every pixel is now no longer a pixel, but it is a small Taylor expansion region. That means it has much more properties than just the intensity. I also have the property of um, what is my local orientation. Uh, what is my local curvature? What is my local color? <coughs> so in every pixel we have a kind of a that is a kind of a stack of properties, and we can now say how do these properties combine? And we call that affinity. And if we do combinations with affinity of those points, for example, lines that have the same orientation, they have a high affinity. They are connected to each other. It's called Gestalt. And the Gestalt laws have been long searching for why do we have grouping. Well, it turns out that the distance is important, the similarity in color is important, similarity in size. So the more properties I have, the better I can combine them into groups. And if you combine them in this way into groups, you see that you get the noses and the ears and you get the next step. So we begin to understand a little bit how these perceptual grouping stages go, and if you combine these noses, etc., they can go into faces. So this is a geometrical view of how increment, contextual increment, may explain what these networks do. Now we go to energy saving. How is the visual system saving energy? 
And one of the things that is remarkable if you look at uh, the cones and the rods in the visual system, that in the pedicle of the cone you see there is a separation, the signal goes to a channel that's called the on channel, and it goes into the off channel. Two completely the same channels, but one is the positive and one is the negative. And why do we have two completely, and by the way the same is for the rods. Why do we have two channels? If we look in the, in the retina, we see that there is a what's called the inner nuclear layer. And in this layer we see a very nice separation of the off cells, close to the receptors, and the on cells. So this we can call I minus, and this is I plus. It seems ridiculous to, mean, to make an I minus and an I plus, because if you add them together you get zero. And this happens in all mammals, in all insects, already at the very first synapse. Synapse. So it must be quite important. I think that it has to make with uh, temporal delay. If you take a signal and you subtract the signal a little bit later, what you do is subsequent frame subtraction. And this is how every observation camera is, uh, surveillance camera is, is working. So the next frame is subtracted from the previous frame, and so on. So you see the difference. And that's exactly what I do here. You have, a you have a street scene here, and all the pixels that are the same, they get to zero. But if they move, you see, I only see the differences. And if I only transmit the differences to the brain, and that is what you see here to the right, you only transmit 4 to 5 percent of the data. So in the brain is a good memory. You just have to see this once and then you keep it, and you don't have to scan this over and over and over. Our video systems do this continuously, 30 frames per second. It's a waste of, of data. So this may seem that it is uh, uh, an efficient way to send images to the brain and to process. And it may be that the, the delay, because you have to delay one of these systems, is in the cortex, so you have full control over this delay. Another way to save energy is use color in an intelligent way. We use color by treating pixels, every pixel, three times RGB. So we have a red, a green, and a blue camera looking at the same time, all at the same resolution. So you have 20 megapixels, you have 20 million red, 20 million green, and 20 million blue cells. In the visual system, if you look in the brain, you see this is on the cortex, only very few cells, the uh, yellow ones, are color sensitive. So why is that so, so very few? And there's a nice development by Levin, and he looked at colorization, he took a color image, and he said, okay, let's make it black and white, and I only color, for example, in the face, a few stripes with the pink color of the face, and here with the yellow of this shirt and the green of his arm. And because he could very, do, very well do segmentation, and neural networks can do very well segmentation, you can fill the whole segment with this color. And you see it is hardly discriminated. This image is hardly discriminated from the original. So we only need a few color elements per segment to fill it in. Well, this is called colorization. Sorry. The last uh, step for energy is foveation. If you look at my, you see the retina here, this point, you see a black point. But there's only one. But if you look here, there's another black point. And there's another black point here, another black point here. In total, there are 12 of these black points. And you only see one. And actually, why is this? Because you only see sharp in the middle, that's your fovea. If you plot the receptive field size to the eccentricity, that is the size from the fovea, the fovea is the center here. You have very tiny ones, this is the diameter. And it increases linearly. So the further away you go, here we have very large receptive fields, and here we have very small ones. You see two groups, 
this is the group for motion detection, and this is the group for shape detection. But both have the same, they are bigger when you are further out from the fovea. And this foveation is used in what's called SLAM. And SLAM is simultaneously localization and mapping, very, very famous in automotive and robotics. And I found a very nice picture from uh, Eric Nelson, a student in UC Berkeley. And he walks around with a LIDAR on his head and his uh, uh, laptop. And this LIDAR is his foveating system that scanned the world. And if you know, self-driving cars have this infrared LIDAR laser also on board. And while he walks around, he builds up the scene around him. So he has a, a memory and stores more and more while walking around. This is his environment. So you don't have to look everywhere with the same resolution, but you just point at a specific place. And only where you look, you fill it up with high resolution. And that's another extreme, uh, yeah, really nice, extremely nice way to, uh, re to increase your efficiency. And uh, this was used by uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Bram van Ginneke and his uh, PhD students. They said, let's take a filter that is very tiny and sharp in the middle, but it gets coarser to the outside. So this is like our retina with a fovea. This has the advantage that convolution with these filters are very efficient because you cover a larger area with less computing. And it turns out that uh, they outperformed um, CNNs that had uniform patches, and they came very close to the uh, performance of a human expert by using the same trick as we see do uh, the fovea on, on the retina. I come to my conclusions, and I hope to have give you a little bit of a flavor. I didn't have really much time, but I just wanted to give you the introduction to this field. The visual system is a super study object for explainable AI. There is so much known in literature about the visual system and also the other way around. Second realization is the retina is not a camera, but it is a perceptual grouping preparator. A camera brings images from A to B, and if it was just bringing the images to the first layer in V1, yeah, we needed another perceptual system to look at that image. So the homunculus the homunculus doesn't exist, so we already have the processing uh, in the very first stages of, of the retina right here. And of all these multi-layer systems, the visual system and the artificial system, deep learning is actually representation learning. So efficiency in this representation is the key thing. So you want to build up your system, your signal, and your signal can be anything, you want to decompose it in some very basic, a small set of basis functions, and that's called representation. The technique, there are several ways to do that. It's, it, it's called dimension reduction. PCA is a very famous one, but there, there are many more. And my last remark is that modern brain science is just as sophisticated as modern AI. Um, there's a lot of separation still between neurosciences and artificial intelligence sciences. If I ask people what are stellate amacrine cells, uh, most people don't know. And if you ask neuroscientists what are generative adversarial networks, it's difficult. There are two completely different jargons, and it, it is hoped that it will become much more together. And I, I'm, I'm happy to see uh, more and more conferences bringing together neuroscientists and computer scientists to learn from each other. Because I think education is the first step to appreciate each other's field. Um, I hope to contribute by a new book. It will take me several months more to write it, but I will write, um, it's now about 48 chapters, uh, about all of this that I discussed in this uh, small, but in a small uh, lecture, but I go much deeper, of course, we also have much more space and time. It will be called Neuromathematics of Deep Learning and Vision. Thank you very much for your attention and time for some discussion. Bart, 
Uh, it's it's a wonderful lecture. So um, we we definitely, Paolo and I have some questions, but uh, I also would like to invite the audience. If you have any kind of questions, please put them in the chat in the Q and A uh, while we we you know chat about this topic. So I would like to invite you, Paolo. Um, if uh, you know what is on your mind on this topic. <laughs> No, it's it's uh, no first. No, thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor. Like you know, it's always fascinating to to hear to hear you and and to hear also about the topic, right? Like it's it's I think a, a passion <laughs> for all of us, and and I think like when when I hear this, it's like I also find it very almost poetic, right? That there's on on one side we see that uh, how how the brain and what we know about the brain, how is it structured, how the visual system works, and and all the different systems and, and how that structure and that how uh, complex structure, how it is inspiring actually innovation, right? All these, all these applications like um, self-driving cars, uh, deep learning, segmentation, et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, you know, do you think or what, what examples do you, do you have in mind? Like, like kind of the other way around. So like how also deep learning and new technology is also helping to understand better the brain, like kind of like this feedback loop, right? Like this almost poetic feedback loop that the brain inspires AI and AI is helping to understand the brain to inspire, right? To get back at it. Like, do you have any, any examples like uh, of uh, new applications out there to understand the brain? Well, yeah, it, it's exactly as you said, it, it really works two ways. Uh, we we have now, in terms of recognition, uh, we are outstanding with all our AI systems. I, I uh, brain tumor recognition segmentation. Uh, we can see in the retinal images uh, lots of early signs for diabetes. You name it. But we the other way learning from the brain is the last example. For example, where we have this fovea. Um, only do the center right and at the end take it much coarser. It saves a lot of computation time. It makes your AI, let's say three to five times faster and even better. So that's quite nice. What we also can do is if you look at, for example, color images, RGB, in MRI, we can use also color images by looking at T1, T2, proton density images and, and, and see them as color images and then process them in the way we see as, as the brain is doing. And, and actually there are so many similarities we can look at. So it's, it's, uh, it's only just beginning. And as I said, we are now looking at static images. So we do recognition of, let's say an MRI image, a CT image, and we will definitely go much more also to analyzing video sequences. So I expect also in the medical arena that uh, uh, we have this MRI flow, uh, we have uh, ultrasound, there's a lot of video. So uh, our eye is a lot video oriented. So I expect a lot of developments there as well. Um, no, 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 it's, it's really fascinating topic. And um, uh, that, that slide with the, with the kittens, you know, it's, uh, um, it's very interesting. And um, I, I got reminded of a book that I read some years ago where they also use the visual system. I think it's why red doesn't sound like bell um, to understand consciousness. And they did this kind of even human experiments with goggles where they were, you know, students, PhD students in psychology, they were like uh, uh, wearing these goggles full time. And sometimes it would mirror left, right, or like up, down, and they will uh, over, course of months uh, relearn uh, you know how to see normally and it's just uh, it's it's absolutely fascinating um, and I'm that's I exactly what happens you you relearn so you do not internally put your brain upside down or, or, or something but you learn a complete new set and you can learn infinitely so you can learn uh, reading uh, mirror scripts you can learn uh, yeah, all kinds of new characters, but you learn the new. It also, yeah. and the most learning is in the first three months of your life. Absolutely, <laughs> it must be, uh, it must be such an experience. 
you know, to get all of this data from so many sensors just coming, uh, you know, and making, trying to make sense out of it. It's, uh, I think it's really, really fascinating topic. Um, and I, I wanted to ask you, so, so I think that this, this lecture is, uh, you know, it beautifully explains, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like, uh, gives us a little bit more of idea of how AI works. And um, the, the, we need more mutual knowledge between, you know, neuroscience and data science to make progress. Uh, and what do you think is limiting between these two fields um, um, that are, are they not talking enough? Uh, how do you think we can, uh, you know, bridge this gap and we can make this happen more effectively? Thanks. It's an excellent question. And I read a lot of literature and I study still daily uh, a lot of, let's say, recent papers coming out in uh, the archive or bar archive and uh, the, the latest conferences. But it's really difficult for the other group to read the other group. So if you see the, the latest paper on neurophysiology, it's a terminology that's not easy to grasp. It's a lot of genetics, uh, a lot of biochemistry. And for the neuroscientists, it's not easy to read about the statistical approaches and, and graph networks and residual networks and the generative adversarial networks. The language is so completely different that yeah. what we need is yeah, a whole set of tutorial sessions. And I see luckily more and more conferences coming up where these two groups are brought together and being trained in each other's jargon because yeah. they're really very deeply, uh, they're, they're, they're so sophisticated that it really takes time to learn from the other group. I spent my whole life reading nature papers on, on, on biological things and so on, and it's relatively easy, but that, that takes time. And I hope my book will contribute a little bit in, the book is dedicated to both groups. So I like to be yeah, a tutorial book for both neuroscientists that I slowly explain what, what happens in these mathematical steps, but also to the AI people, what happens really with modern brain science? What are people doing? And if you get a respectful relation between the groups from, hey, uh, quite amazing that you are so far, uh, let's study this more and more. I hope to get, yeah. And of course, there's a big group that already does this, but relatively small given the, yeah, the huge attention for uh, AI because it works so well and you can earn a lot of money with it and so on. And uh, yeah, and the biology world is fascinated by what can we find, but the interaction between the two groups, yeah, it could be much better and I hope it's coming up in the next years. I will oh, certainly absolutely. try to help it. Uh, yeah, I remember, you know, coming to, to your group and um, we had like um, um, people who were working very on ma very mathematical models who are somewhere in between with image processing and visualization and just like looking at the formulas and understanding the the language was uh, something um, pretty intimidating in the beginning um so um uh, let's yeah, see and uh, well go ahead I, I, I have like you know, related because also now it makes me think that there's one thing is like the, the language right so understand the other people and the other domain and I think related as well might be like the um, even the data, like the example of, of the cat is, is really nice, right? Like AI is in a way, or this format of AI of deep learning and these technologies are like as good as the data that you train it, right? If you're training just horizontal lines or, or if you're training it with, uh, you know, I know, one type of images and bad quality of images, then your algorithm is really good at spotting bad yeah. quality images, right? But and and also so that kind of link it like do you think like or how how impactful is is this like the 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 type of data and the quality of data that you train it that you try to build your algorithms and the, the knowledge right because the other challenge is you know to understand is it good data and and actually what do the images mean what is a T one what is a T two what is diffusion like what those pixels represent right I think it, the like, last what, what are you saying yeah represents that's actually the key word mm -hmm. we we've come more and more to realize that uh, ai learning is representation learning that means mm -hmm. you you learn this i explained this a little bit with this pca but you learn an internal representation and 
that representation should describe your data. So you, the data should be relatively homogeneous in the sense that you say, okay, now I can really represent it. If you change your data, you get another representation. So if you get very inhomogeneous data, you, you get a huge re representation. So you need to learn longer. And we, yeah, we, we understand more and more how this is gonna work. But as you said, the quality of the data determines the quality of this representation. It's the old paradigm, garbage in, garbage out. So if you have good quality data uh, and you have also a nice classification of these data, so you learn the right thing. Uh, if you say, well, this is a face of a man and you tell the system it's a woman, that's wrong information. Uh, you have to be, yeah, the classes has to be very well defined. And the success is clear because that's exactly what we do. We do today more and more, what we have done so far is mostly supervised learning. That you say, okay, we give a lot of data to the system and we tell it what it is. And the humans can do unsupervised learning. So we learn from huge sets of data, finally, that this is a chair, no matter how I see it from different sides. And I can recognize all kinds of different chairs by only seeing a few of them. So we're now trying to understand what, what is the, the basic representation from what is a chair actually. And then it turns out there are some very poor representations in what, what makes a chair different from something else. And those things, if you learn those well, you, you, yeah, you, you have a very nice representation indeed. But to answer your question, quality of data is essential. Um, we have a question from the audience. I, I just spotted, sorry about that. So uh, from Jasper Levnik, uh, the question is, maybe it is interesting to discuss how explainable AI will expedite acceptance of AI and continuous learning in clinical environments. What other advances uh, can help here? I completely understand that uh, for any medical team, it's essential that you want to know how do the tools work? Can we trust these tools? Yeah. And AI is explainable. AI is still in the beginning, and there are lots of conferences now, and big uh, groups like MICI. They all have now conferences, uh, seminars, etc., on explainable AI. And the number of approaches is just overwhelming. Uh, people look at you know what kind of mathematics, etc., and the holy grail is not there yet. I gave a, a geometrical approach, but people also use Bayesian approaches and statistical approaches and graph approaches. And to tell you the truth, we don't know yet how it all works, but it is beginning. And I'm pretty sure that in a couple of years, there will be breakthroughs coming. Um, I, yeah, I'm, I'm very confident of it. The geometrical tools that I discussed are still in the minority, but I think they, they may have quite some impact. This originated by uh, the professor that I had in my early times, Professor Jan Koenering, and I think he was, uh, he was right in several uh, areas. But there's still a lot to come. And it has so much attention that uh, don't worry about it. People are very, very burned to get AI explained because that will be the major step for, of course, acceptance, not only medical, but in businesses, wherever. Yeah, and I, I think that the regulatory bodies, the FDA, C, Mark, um, that there will be a lot of that they have to continuously learn and you know uh, evolve, especially in this uh, period of time. Yeah, uh, of course. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, Paolo, you said that you you want to discuss a couple of other topics. <laughs> we have yeah, some there's... minutes left. <laughs> No, there was actually like uh, one is like uh, coincidentally just maybe yesterday or before yesterday. Right now the we there was like a tweet coming out, uh, I think from um, Imperial College, like the folks that like relate to NHS, so in UK, uh, and uh, there was like this this tweet with a nice T1 images of a brain, <laughs> right? <laughs> and then like one of these like a row on top with the one images of a brain and then below another one. And then the question was like, which one of these is, is a true brain and which one is like fake? So that's like, there's all these methods, right? Like generational, like generating 
images or generating like new data? Like what, you know, what kind of applications or you know, what, what's, what is exciting about being able to generate this kind of brains? <laughs> Well, what happens here is that uh, if you master this internal representation, I showed it from a very tiny patch that you say you can make any patch. Sorry, my. My sound was interrupted. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. We yeah. Can hear you. Um, the trick is in this representation. If you have a representation of a face, and you say, okay, I have the basis elements that describe a face. Uh, so let's say 20 um, yeah, basic face images, and you can combine them in any way to make any other face. So you can turn the knob to make any face. And that's often what you see, that you have these uh, uh, warping from a man into a woman or a guy getting a beard or, but that's actually turning the knobs on these coefficients in front of these representations, these, these basis components. And you can do the same for any image. So if you have the basis, let's say for an MRI image, you can turn the knobs and change it into something. And before we didn't have this very good representations yet because it was based on not enough data, but today we have it. I did the experiment, for example, that uh, this is website, um, um, this face does not exist dot com. Mm -hmm. And if you run it, you get a face. And if you run it again, you get another face. So I run it 100,000 times and I get a database of 100,000 faces. And from these databases, you make the representation. <clears throat> and then you can make quite easily a, yeah, a system with dials and knobs, and you can change any face into any other face. And you have the same as for anything not only for a face, because a face is extremely important for humans. We even have a dedicated area in our brain just dedicated to faces, the whole face processing. And what you find there, I'll discuss it in detail in my book, is exactly this representation. So the different cells, what do they do? And we have separate areas for words. So it's, it, it's quite astonishing. And with this super fMRI, the high resolution that we have today with seven Tesla scanners, et cetera, we can nicely locate these separate areas. And of course, you have to think, why do we have a separate area for a face, a separate area for uh, word representations? And if you scan Chinese people, they may have different uh, or a more extensive area because you have so many more characters. On the other hand, we have so many words. But this representation gives now the clue to generative images and these if you see what these networks do it's actually two two networks and one one generates and the other tests is it right and they and they continuously compete with each other but by competing they learn well what they learn is exactly to tune this representation right and then you can turn the knobs so you have these famous famous movies where you can change everything and today you have apps and if you want to add something you want to add uh, I don't know, eyebrows or a moustache. Yeah. It's just that. Yeah. And uh, it's, uh, it's very good that you mentioned, you know, a high resolution, you know, MRI, but also um, I think a very interesting application would be for uh, low resolution machines. So, you know, MRIs are great machines, but they're like really heavy. And I think that um, uh, if we use everything we've learned from high resolution um, MRI, then, um, you know, we can improve the quality of the data of low field machines. And that gives us a, a lot of possibilities. That's a very active field. It's called super resolution. It yeah. works. And there are many examples now that because we have such wonderful big data, uh, if you have high resolution training data, uh, it's a, it's a fantastic way to uh, increase the resolution of, of lower resolution data. Well, we have another uh, interesting question from the audience uh, from Farhad uh, Piri. Uh, thank you so much, Professor. I have a question regarding visual hallucination. In many neurodegenerative and psychiatric disorders, retinal layer changes and many cells in the retina decline. Today's research exclusively focuses on the visual cortex to explain visual hallucinations of people with schizophrenia, for instance. 
Can we study retinal abnormalities with AI to address visual hallucinations in those patients? I'm not sure if I'm qualified to answer that. And I didn't do research on just this, but the retina is very much part of the brain itself. So yeah. the, the retina is, is, is brain tissue. And it's just the beginning of a long stage of, uh, yeah, stepwise incremental building up your image. So the retina is not a camera. A camera is bringing images from A to B. So it's not bringing the images from all your rods and cones to the next layer because yeah, th then someone should be looking at it. You should have a homunculus and we don't have that. So the retina is really already doing the first steps. So the fact that we have several coarse retinas and from these coarse retinas, we assemble a sharp picture internally. This assembly stage is what happens in the brain. And if something goes wrong with that assembly stage, then you can get all kinds of strange things. You can get hallucinations and there are lots and lots of hallucinations. Of course, there are hallucinations induced by, by whatever you take or you have people with migraine, you have people with vaso with the constrictions, so they have a little blood supply that goes le less to one region to another. You get all kinds of visual effects. So it can be extremely broad, but the building up of a scene is happening in the brain and it already begins in the retina. And this whole process, that yeah, has to be all right, of course, if you disturb it, you get things like hallucinations. Yeah, definitely. And um, even like just eye tracking, just tracking how, uh, you know, uh, humans are processing images. Uh, it's an interesting marker for some diseases like autism and uh, uh, neurodegenerative diseases. And just before we conclude, so um, Bart, I know that your, your lectures have always been super interactive and you've been kind of like coding in Mathematica while lecturing. Um, so so you, you will uh, publish this book, but uh, I think you mentioned that you will also have this kind of like videos per chapter. Can you just uh, quickly explain on that before we conclude this uh, yeah this my article. book will will not be a book it will be a fully interactive book so uh, i cannot really put i can put it on paper but it is really to be meant yes. to seen on the screen uh, it will be small chapters in uh, medium.com and uh, towards data science so these are catching attention let's say seven minute reads uh, it will be fully interactive with code so um, you can turn on every knob and see the things. Um, all the mathematics will be explained. I will use in Mathematica. That's the, the highest level language that we know. It makes it easy because Mathematica is today has developed into almost to speaking English. So it's, it's, it, it's very understandable. No abbreviations, fast. So it will be more than a book. It will be an interactive tutorial. Well, I'm, I'm very excited to, um, to see it coming out. I think um, we'll definitely um, we'll, we'll be looking in Qmenta at, uh, at uh, those tutorials and learn a lot. So thank you so much for, for this beautiful lecture and this beautiful discussion. Um, um, it was a pleasure, Vesta and, and Paolo, and I'm proud of you okay. and very happy to be part of this uh, seminar. Um, we'll, um, some, some of the people ask uh, that they, they had to leave earlier. We'll have the, the recordings available. So uh, we will send um, uh, the post webinar survey um, and also the, the recordings of this lecture will be available on our, on our website. Uh, we also want to hear about uh, what kind of topics uh, you would like to, to have in the next webinar. So please um, send us uh, ideas and questions. We, uh, we love to get ins inspired and to get like outstanding people like um, Professor Romani um, uh, on our webinars. Uh, we had a quite busy uh, first half of the year with a very nice webinar almost every month. We'll take a break um, in August. So uh, we'll see each other in the fall. Um, again, Bart, I want to thank you for the really nice lecture and I want to um, um, just wish everybody happy summer and happy August. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Professor, and thanks everybody.